Is it on now? Oh, hey, hello, welcome. Um, my name is Allison, uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the founder of Library Freedom Project. I will let my colleague here introduce himself. I am Brian Jones. I'm a librarian at Nashville Public Library, currently librarian means systems administrator. So uh, in this talk, we're going to tell you uh, a lot of things about a project that we have been working on in the last year or so called Library Freedom Institute, which is something that came out of work that I started with Library Freedom Project. So just by way of background, I founded Library Freedom Project in, uh, depending on what timeline I'm personally looking at, like either 2014 or 2015. The mission of Library Freedom Project is to make real the promise of intellectual freedom in libraries. And um, I started it basically with the objective to bring meaningful and practical privacy education to librarians. I did this for a few different reasons. Uh, librarians have a really strong ethical commitment to privacy. They um, have codified their commitment to privacy in their core values of librarianship and other professional ethical codes. And also because libraries are some of the only places where people can go and get free education about how to use their computers. So there's an ethical commitment, there's a kind of practical environment that's already in place. And then the third thing is that many libraries serve the kinds of people who are under the greatest threats from the loss of privacy and the surveillance state. So um, for example, immigrants use libraries in much greater numbers than they use other public services, they have a greater amount of trust in library spaces. This is true about a number of different kinds of marginalized people. So I was working in a library actually here in, um, well, not actually in Cambridge, just outside of Cambridge in Watertown. And I started teaching other librarians about free software and privacy concepts and how to teach other people about it. And it just kind of snowballed into this bigger and bigger thing where then I started teaching librarians across the US and then also in some other countries. Um, that, uh, that is basically what Library Freedom Project was for the first two or three years. Um, we had a lot of support and a lot of interest in the project. We were very fortunate to win the Free Software Foundation's Award for Social Benefit in 2016. But what I learned in doing that work with Library Freedom Project was that it, it couldn't just be me going around teaching librarians, that it had to scale into something much bigger uh, if it was going to have a really meaningful impact. So that's when I got the idea to start Library Freedom Institute. I'm gonna tell you um, a little bit about that in a second, but I want Brian to give an introduction to how he got into this work. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna cover up your stuff. So I got into this work because in library land, issues of free speech, censorship, or anti-censorship, and privacy are under uh, an advocacy umbrella known as intellectual freedom. I don't, I don't know how broadly that term is used outside of libraries uh, for those issues. Um, so uh, I don't think there can be any intellectual freedom without software freedom, and I've really tried to amplify that message within uh, library land. Um, Allison has mentioned that librarians have specific ethics, professional ethics, about protecting people's privacy, protecting uh, what they read and what they research, and keeping that secure. Um, so really, proprietary code kind of makes that impossible. Um, so at the same time, people love libraries, they trust libraries, so Pew Research Center has done studies that people still trust libraries more than Google. Um, last year, <laughs> Forbes uh, published an editorial suggesting that public libraries be replaced with Starbucks and Amazon bookstores. So <laughs> the response to this article was so vehemently negative that uh, the article was retracted and replaced with a statement that said, um, 
This article was outside of this contributor's specific area of expertise and has since been removed. So when was the last time in Forbes that a call for a public service to be privatized uh, was deleted uh, from their website? So um, people want a non-commercialized, non-surveilled public space. Usually libraries are that for most people or people perceive libraries that way. So libraries are the perfect place for education about software freedom and privacy. So, the American Library Association has this program called Choose Privacy Week, and it is to raise uh, issues of advocacy about privacy. So, as programs during Choose Privacy Week, I started doing privacy classes based on the Library Freedom Project's templates. Um, at first, I had this uh, local hacker named Amber Adams come and uh, run these for me, but I soon realized that I could probably handle them myself, just based on the tech level. Um, of the folks that were coming, but I wouldn't be here without Amber, so I wanted to give her a shout out. Um, and then I think the reason that I'm here, as opposed to other members of the Library Freedom Project, is my classes have a really heavy uh, free software emphasis. Um, uh, because it was really something that I emphasized a lot. Um, now, we all know, at least everyone in this room knows, that everything is a free software issue but proprietary software really affects libraries acutely, and I just kind of wanted to give you a rundown of um, how it affects libraries. Um, for one thing, uh, third-party vendors force us to use DRM to deliver content, uh, and we're sort of uh, handcuffed in that way. And then also, they usually put users at risk, and as Allison pointed out, many of our users are the most vulnerable in our community. Um, so here are two uh, examples just in the last two weeks. So um, a huge uh, database vendor uh, in academic libraries was found to keep all their user passwords in a plain, te plain text publicly exposed database. Or there's another vendor that does streaming music for uh, streaming movies for public libraries, and they uh, had their um, Elasticsearch database exposed to the public. So that's pretty typical. And then, of course, they also have um, click wrap, EULAs, dark patterns, uh, and legalese, you know, in their agreements, and um, that basically uh, get out of libraries' ethical obligations and vacuum up uh, patrons' uh, uh, PII. And then, of course, a, an issue that a lot of you probably know about is the erosion of the first sale doctrine. Now, this is tied up with copyright law here in the United States, and um, the current uh, case law that suggests that a digital copy is different than a print copy. So uh, libraries, when they buy digital content, they have to buy licenses for a certain number of, of quote-unquote checkouts or for a certain number of time. But these licenses actually cost more than the print books or physical materials, sometimes 40% more, sometimes three times as much. So libraries are actually going bankrupt to try to meet this demand. Um, so uh, those are very specific issues to libraries, but the things that we talk about in LFI are a lot broader, but hopefully I can bring it all back home. Yeah, so I think Brian gave a great background on how libraries present a really unique opportunity to talk about issues of privacy and free software, but they also have their own unique set of challenges so this is, this, this is exactly why I decided to start Library Freedom Institute. So essentially what Library Freedom Institute is, is a training program for librarians to learn how to become privacy advocates in their communities. We ran the pilot institute last year with 13 participants. Brian was one of the participants in it. And uh, we, we had to restrict it to the United States just because of the funder. Uh, the funder is the Institute of Museum and Library Services. It's an independent federal US agency that funds museums and libraries. And what, uh, the, what we did with Library Freedom Institute was, as Brian said, we tried to have broad themes about surveil the, the surveillance assemblage, or otherwise sometimes called surveillance capitalism. Um, broad themes of free software and harm reduction, but that could be practically implemented in library environments. So there's basically three areas that I think most of what we, we covered fits into. So the first one would be kind of like 
just the basics of privacy technology, learning about free software, learning about threat modeling, learning how to teach classes to other people. The next area is like library policy, like making system-wide changes, affecting vendor agreements, making, you know, finding better vendors for your library, advocating for that sort of thing, advocating for other kind of system-wide things like maybe removing the CCTV cameras in the parking lot or, you know, things of that nature. And then the third category is having an influence even more broadly in your local community, understanding how to um, stay on top of privacy legislation or talk to lawmakers or talk to other stakeholders out in the world as somebody who has a unique interest and stake in it and also someone who can, um, can help bring the public into those conversations too. So what, uh, what Library Freedom Institute is um, kind of from a like, you know, infrastructural standpoint, it is a six month online program uh, there's one in-person component over a weekend. We partnered with uh, New York University, and so we use some of their facilities and we meet together as a group in New York. We have weekly lectures on different themes around privacy, surveillance, um, and software freedom issues. And we, uh, we bring in guest lecturers from around the kind of like privacy world for those. We have... Um, a combination of like readings and discussion and assignments and at the end of the course the goal was basically two things to create a community of librarians to um, not just be advocates in their own regions but to support one another in doing this work together so that we can push for broad scale systemic change um, and um, there was another goal and I can't think of what it is right now, but it will come back to me after Brian says some things. <laughs> so just, <laughs> yes, so, <laughs> so uh, the things I learned or things that were made better uh, by LFI. So my classes got way more dynamic as opposed to just like a list of tech tips. Um, I learned how to frame privacy practices in like basic computer security concepts like principle of least privilege and like threat modeling. And I knew about those things before, but I think I, it was hard to sort of put all the pieces together. Um, I learned how to make it small and maybe de-emphasize the NSA and other three-letter organizations and think more about your community and the people you love and the people around you. And the fact that the people around you are making unsafe decisions, you are unsafe too. Um, I also got a chance to deep dive into policy issues, and at the time when I started, I was a public services librarian. I wasn't a sysadmin, so that typically, reading a lot of white papers and watching a lot of FTC hearings was typically not part of my job. Um, and then uh, I think maybe this is uh, a philosophical uh, assertion, but one of the things that was said early on in LFI is that abuse is guaranteed, and that stayed with me the whole way through. So. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully that can haunt you after today. Yeah, we, we try not to take too much of a cynical approach, but I think it's probably more about like realism. Um, so the librarians that we, um, we primarily wanted in the program were those that had a public facing role. So this ended up being mostly people from public libraries. But we also had a number of folks from community colleges. Um, we also tried to include people who were from places that wouldn't necessarily have their own professional development funding. So there was a kind of you know, economic piece to it, materialist piece. And then in terms of what we covered week to week, it was a little bit of everything. You know, in six months, it goes by pretty fast, but you can cram a lot of information in this very, very large topic. So we covered a lot of things related to government surveillance, understanding the kind of big big issues, um, but then how that plays out in our local communities, um, you know, what the intelligence agencies and federal law enforcement um, have and how that kind of trickles down to local police or, um, you know, how it affects the people's lives who are um, impacted by federal law enforcement. We talked about uh, corporate surveillance a whole lot. We talked about Things like, you know, scams and fraud and doxing. Um, threat modeling was a really big component of the course because we wanted to cover a lot of ground, but we wanted to 
keep it focused on real people and what their real uh, situations are and the real material impacts that surveillance has on their lives. So just to, to mention a few of the different weeks and some of the guest speakers to give you an idea of the breadth and depth that we covered in LFI. So we had Cade Crockford from the ACLU of Massachusetts give a talk about CCTV and the use of CCTV in public spaces. And that week was actually more kind of about like the concept of security from a philosophical standpoint. Like what does it mean to be made secure and who are we talking about? Whose security is, uh, is guaranteed um, and whose security is at risk? And then we read a bunch of things about some case studies of libraries that had implemented CCTV and how it went wrong. And so we had these very specific practical examples from other libraries in, you know, out in our world where when they installed CCTV, the thing that went wrong was two things. One, it basically had some mission creep. So they installed the cameras thinking it would keep their staff safe when they went out in the parking lot at night. But what they found out was that then their local police wanted to start requesting the footage all the time without warrants. And it, and it created this very hostile relationship with the local police. And so one of the libraries in these case studies ended up actually removing the cameras because navigating that new relationship was, was not at all what they bargained for. Um, so then we talked about kind of you know, how this happens with a lot of surveillance technology. People are well intended when they implement it, but then all these other things go wrong. Um, we had April Glazer, formerly of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, now a journalist at Slate. April came on and did like a whole kind of explainer about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and the kind of like Wild West environment that corporations enjoy right now. No regulation, absolutely limitless access to um, personal information and no consequences. So in that week, we talked not only about what had happened with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, but what is the deal with the regulatory environment and, wh and who are the watchdogs who are supposed to be keeping um, us safe as consumers and you know what, what is going on there and how can we have an impact. We had um, Eva Galperin from the Electronic Frontier Foundation come on and talk about threat modeling and also some threat models that don't get a lot of attention from the privacy world, so like you know, domestic violence or um, personal relationships and that sort of thing. We had Freddie Martinez from Lucy Parsons Labs come to talk about law enforcement threat modeling and using FOIA to learn about surveillance technology in your local communities. Jesse Rossman, also of the ACLU of Massachusetts, who is a, an attorney there, she came on and talked about the right to privacy and, ha and you know, what it means from the kind of like constitutional standpoint, but how that has actually played out and, and you know, not actually been, been a real reality for um, most communities and certainly for almost no one now. Harlow Holmes of the Freedom of the Press Foundation talked about mobile devices and the unique problems um, with trying to make them more private and secure. And then uh, in our New York weekend, we focused on helping each other learn about doing trainings and talks and speaking about privacy together. So it's not just about like teaching classes, but how to have conversations with stakeholders, especially those that might not be convinced about why this stuff is important, how to respond to typical anti-privacy arguments. So we had a whole role playing thing where we came up with a whole list of normal anti-privacy arguments that we've heard and then how we could respond to those like in an elevator or in a board meeting or what have you. Uh, and also over that weekend, we covered some of the higher level technical tools, so Tor Browser and Tails. So we had a whole workshop together about that. There's more? Sure. <laughs> so, okay. So I took all this and ran with it. So what do I do? <laughs> so I, I give workshops and I give talks. So I give these to library patrons, but then also to other librarians and library administrators. So I do this at the library, just like as classes at the library, at um, library conferences or professional development events. And really, uh, my programs sort of consist of three components, and Allison already went over this, but like practical consumer advice, policy and legal overviews, and then my personal favorite, get pumped about privacy, which is good because you can just 
you know, preach a little bit to people and get people fired up and make them care a little more. Um, but all of these three uh, components, no, no matter the venue, I always start with a slide that says, consider the source. So consider the source of who is saying what about privacy. Is it a tech CEO or is it your friendly neighborhood librarian? Just try to get uh, a little bit of media literacy uh, about who's saying what about privacy. But then also consider the source of the technology you're using, like who made it and why. Uh, are they uh, making money off of your data? Are they collecting your data secretly to make money? Um, <clears throat> and then I show, show a GIF of a cute little kid floss dancing, and it says floss, question mark. And then the next slide says floss, no, free Libra open source software. And then I explain uh, software freedom to folks. And these are folks that are not at Libra Planet, <laughs> uh, but they seem to do get under, they, get, they do understand that um, you know, if it's free software, uh, it can be audited, and therefore it's likely more secure, and uh, you're going to have more autonomy. And, and uh, that has seemed to have gone over well. Um, and then if I offer practical consumer advice, it's maybe uh, the sort of user space, typical free software privacy stack. So GNU Linux, KeePass XC, Veracrypt, uh, free OTP, Signal, Firefox, uh, and then Tor Browser and all its mobile babies. Um, so one of the goals for sure is uh, the greater adoption of Tor Browser um, amongst non-techie people and the demystification of Tor, for sure. That is uh, one of my goals. Um, and I can tell you the thing that people are most excited about is Tor. Like They're not excited about Firefox with some plugins. Uh, they are excited about Tor. They're happy to learn about it and very thankful. If I have to do uh, like a pre-conference, something that's very long, like more time than uh, we have here today, then I'll get into things like GPG, Tails, FDroid, Lineage OS, uh, Purism. I, I'm happy to see Purism here. You know, people want a really quick answer. Like, well, what computer do I have that's pro-privacy? I mean, the fact that Purism exists, I can point and say Purism. Um, and then I, I have to give a shout out to my partner Megan too, because if we do a, like a long pre-conference, it's Megan and I do these together. You want me to keep going? Yeah, keep going. Okay. So that's kind of sort of the s practical consumer advice, but then we also do hands-on exercises to get people to think about privacy in ways they haven't before. So first is a spectrum exercise, and we say this side of the room is privacy nihilism, and this side of the room is privacy veganism. If you think privacy is totally dead and there's no hope, uh, go to privacy nihilism. If you are a privacy vegan, you think privacy is the most important thing in the world, there's no democracy without privacy, go to this side of the room. Now remember, the room's a spectrum, so you can stand wherever you want. Or if you can't stand, just point, right? And then we see where people go, and then we ask them, uh, so why did you stand where you did? But then I also ask some other questions, and usually they're somewhat rigged, because often I'm speaking to librarians now. Uh, but I'll say, okay, this side of the room is yes. This side of the room is no, and it's still a spectrum. I'm going to say, a bounty hunter comes to your desk and says, have you seen this person? So walk, yes or no. So if it's librarians, they go over to no. <laughs> They're like fighting, trying to get through the wall. <laughs> and I'm like, so like if privacy is dead, and all of you that were on the nihilism side, why are you over here on no? Uh, so, but there's other, you know, and a few questions like that. And then um, I, tr I try to teach diceware, but in uh, fun ways. Everyone knows what diceware is here, right? Can you explain diceware really fast? Diceware is a method of creating passphrases that are both secure and memorable. You take a, um, a commercially available random number generator known as a die, uh, and you roll it a bunch of times using a method that EFF has on their website, and you come up with a string of words that most people can remember, which is really important when you're teaching folks of many different walks of life. I just thought I was talking for too long. So, okay, so, so, so we will roll up diceware numbers at the beginning without explaining what it is. So later these numbers will uh, translate into words for a passphrase, but We'll just roll up the numbers, and I'll, I'll say to folks, that's your secret code. 
aren't you happy to have a secret code? And then we just go through and talk about, so what are best password practices, right? And then I say, let's figure out what your secret code is. And then we go and they actually get a really long passphrase. So the other thing we might do is like, I might have a passphrase rolled up to begin with, so with a string of like just six random words, and I'll say, write a three sentence short story about this, or even better, a one sentence short story about these words. And, and then we'll have a little contest of like who came up with the best one on the fly. And then we'll go on and talk about best password practices. And then I'll say, okay, now we're gonna write your story. You're gonna have your own story. And then they roll off a passphrase, and then, and then they, they kind of get it in their head that it's pretty easy to actually remember a long passphrase. Um, you want to keep going? Okay. So the other one we do is the risk versus reward exercise. So again, two sides of the room. One side of the room, there's an uh, empty Venn diagram, and it says uh, uh, privacy or security. And the other side of the room, there's an empty Venn diagram, and it says risk versus reward. And then everyone gets a sheet of colored stickers, and each different colored sticker has a privacy, uh, not a privacy feature, but a technology feature on it. So an example might be um, uh, the ability to tag your friends in photographs, or the ability to uh, use biometrics to enter physical locations. Then we have people get up and place their sticker on the Venn diagram whether they think that feature is a security feature uh, or a privacy feature. Or then they, um, another set of features, then we say, is the risk versus the reward? And then what it does is it creates a scatter graph like in real time, and then we talk about uh, you know, why people put their stickers uh, where they did. How are we doing on time? Can you keep going? Okay. So then we do a threat models exercise. Do you want to talk about what threat models are? Do you guys know what threat models are? You're good on that? You want to? Yeah, no, I want you to do it. Uh, Sorry, I, you're doing a great I've, job. I don't want to interrupt your story. I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> so threat models is the idea of defining what you want to protect, what you're going to do to protect it, and, and what the consequences will be if you don't, right? So. We kind of, I kind of run through all those things and have people think about their own threat models. And I give a very mundane example about myself. So, like many people here in the room, I don't have any Google apps on my phone, right? Okay. So, <laughs> so I say I do this because I don't want Google to track me. But then uh, we break everyone into groups, and then I give them sample patrons. Each group gets a sample patron, and they say, figure out a threat model for these patrons. So, what kind of, what kind of library patrons? Would, would we be dealing with here? So one example, someone who has just learned that they're HIV positive but hasn't told their family and friends, so they're using the library for research. So another is someone with low English skills is at the library job hunting. So another is someone is organizing a political action and they're using the library as a workspace. And then another is a child likes to play online games at the library. So in small groups, they develop threat models for each of those kind of patrons, and then we share out and talk about it. And a lot of those I leave deliberately ambiguous, that we have a lot of room to talk. Like, uh, for instance, low English uh, skills to hunt for jobs. Like, I don't mention anything about anyone's immigration status. I just, like, let them suss that out for themselves uh, to get them thinking. Are you finished talking about implementation stuff? Because if you are, I, I have things to say, but... Yeah, I think so. Sweet. Um, so, Brian is really amazing. Uh, imagine this now. There's 12 more people who graduated from Library Freedom Institute that are not just like him, because he's special, but doing the same kind of work in libraries. Um, he's at the Nashville Public Library. We had graduates from, like I said, all over the US. They're doing talks and trainings. They're doing these kind of like really interactive um, workshops with other librarians and also patrons in their community. They're working together on different projects like this. They're creating curriculum. Uh, they're having like some, some sort of passive activities. Like one thing that we did is we had the glass room experience from Tactical Tech and Mozilla go and travel around to a number of the libraries that Library Freedom Institute folks are from. And the glass room experience is basically like a number of different kind of like art interactive projects to teach people, to get people thinking about privacy issues. Um, 
So they're, they're now deployed at all these libraries across the US. Uh, and what's coming next for us, so we have funding to run Library Freedom Institute three more times for a full cohort, which is 30 people. We're about to start the second one in May. Um, so that means that by the end of, the, of those terms, um, we will have about 100 librarians across the US, um, many of them in similar regions together, working with one another, doing this kind of stuff, influencing um, their local library spaces and teaching other people. Um, so I think it's, it's a really exciting future for us you know, something that Brian and I were talking about um, earlier was that right now where we are with Library Freedom Institute, you know, 13 people is great, but it's still, what did you call it, Library Freedom Project Plus? I would say everything, everything, that, everything that I described is really Library Freedom Project Plus. And I, the potential of Library Freedom Institute is like we're just getting started. Because yeah. uh, some of those problems that I mentioned at the beginning with proprietary software and DRM, if we have an army of library advocates uh, around the country, like we can push back on that a lot harder than just me here at Leave the Planet. Yeah, and so that, that's the idea, is creating this community. So um, just to wrap up, to tell you kind of like how, you know, if you know librarians who would want to um, apply for the institute, you can get in touch with us at info at libraryfreedomproject.org or just go to libraryfreedomproject.org. Our curriculum, our discussions, everything is open. Um, I, I don't have time to get to like our, you know, kind of like technical infrastructure, but we, we publish everything openly that we're working on. And so you can follow along. You can even watch our lectures and read our discussion on our discourse forum. And I think we just have a few minutes for questions if anyone has any questions. But thank you so much for listening to us talk about our cool project. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> thank you. If there are any questions, please line up. If you're unable to come down, please raise your hand and I'll bring a wireless microphone to you. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm so happy to see you all. Yay, so thank I'm a you. librarian, Woo! But, um, but I am actually now a doctoral student and I work with master's students who are learning to be librarians. What can I send them to other than the website? Is there a type of training that they can receive? Because um, I know that for the institute that they need to be practicing librarians, correct? Well, not exactly. So it's, we prefer people who are, who are already employed in a library, for sure, because there's a lot of like, stuff that we want them to go and do in their environments. But each cohort, what I'm learning is like, they just have to be kind of complementary to the other members of the cohort, right? So it depends a lot on who applies for the next one. Um, and all that said, I think in the future we will have one that is kind of just for more of the academics, um, depending on how things go. So to answer your question, I think um, you can just send them directly to our contact email, info at libraryfreedomproject.org, and like, we'll hear a little bit more about their situation and figure out what exactly is right for them. Brad, so. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thanks Hi. for your talk. Um, it's very good and hopeful. I'm in library school, and so it's nice to see stuff like this Sweet. happening, because some of the rest of it's not so optimistic. It can be um, true, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, wanted, I have a bunch of questions. One of the things I was wondering about, in terms of people coming to the Institute, because at least in the program I'm in, the like technical side is pretty seriously lacking. Do you have to do a lot of catch up? Do people do a lot of self study? Like how do you transfer those sorts of skills? Because some of it ends up being that way. Great question. I'll say a couple things and maybe you can also. Um, so uh, with the, the people who were in the last cohort I think were really all over the map in terms of their technical understanding. I tried to make it so that we had some like kind of heavier hitting technical stuff but we we started on the fairly simple things, so passwords, and we had some, um, some of our guest speakers covered some like really kind of basic 101 level, you know, security and privacy stuff. Um, so I don't think that it's necessarily true that people have to play catch up, and we try to have, um, we try to make it so that you can participate where, at whatever level you're on. 
Um, so Brian was really one of the more, I think, technically inclined people in the last one. So do you want to speak to your experience of that and how the story was? Um, my experience is that Allison is a very kind teacher. <laughs> so I, I, I think that she's a really good example of how uh, free software can be accessible. And uh, if someone has concerns about them not having the tech skills that they think they need or something, they would be fine in Library Freedom Institute. Yeah, and I think just one more thing to say. In the, in the beginning, I had some um, ambitious goals for teaching like Git and things like that, and it just got dropped because I, I could tell that some of the folks weren't ready. So it, it's, a, it's a, an organic kind of developing thing depending on who is in the cohort. So Cool. Thanks for your work. Thank you. Hello. Um, so really glad to see so many other librarians here. It's, Me it's too. excellent. Yay. Uh, and both of the previous question askers had similar questions to mine. So I'll ask a third question that's um, pretty basic, which is, are you planning on <clears throat> releasing the um, syllabus or the um, lesson plans or even just the course itself as open coursework or openly licensed content? Yes. Open, open educational resources? It's already all, um, most of, from, from the last cohort, it's on our GitHub repo um, under a, an open source license, and I forget which one, actually. Is it Creative Commons? I don't remember. But it's, it's all under a permissive open source license. And um, the next one, I think we're not going to use uh, GitHub. We're going to put, we have a, a media wiki. Um, that we're using, and so it'll be, it'll all be up on there. And so, what's on there? Um, our our schedule and weekly curriculum. So the readings and discussion questions. Our discussion forum can be. Um, you can only um, have write access if you're in the cohort, but you can have read access if you're anybody. And so that's just um, libraryfreedom.chat. And then um, the lectures are um, are recorded and also hosted on our site. So. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, great talk. Thank you. I uh, brings up, th I'm sorry, three questions. <laughs> Is uh, all those great talks that you, talk that you mentioned, are they out there on video streaming by any chance or? We don't uh, stream them, we record the lectures and they're on, um, they, they are on our wiki. And, library okay, Freedom. So, wiki. so we could get to them. Mm -hmm. And the next thing is, if I have a, a work that I want to contribute to my local library, is it true that they can't put it on the shelf without paying uh, an additional licensing fee? Uh, well, every library is different, but um, they, there are some fairly restrictive collection development policies. Do you want to speak to that at all? I think that's basically all there is to say. Without knowing exactly what library, I mean, they do have requirements about um, what they what they can and can't include in the collection. Um, Sounds more complicated than I might have thought. Yeah, and honestly, there, <laughs> the, it's, it varies so much at a granular level um, that I, every library I've worked at is different. Okay, and the third question is, uh, there were librarians in Connecticut who were being asked about their readers' uh, habits by the feds. And they had a gag order, they couldn't talk about it. Has that problem been solved? Yes, so what you're referring to the Connecticut Four, they received a national security letter in 2005. They fought it with the help of the ACLU of Connecticut, and what eventually happened was the FBI dropped the suit against them. And have they uh, dropped the habit? Have they dropped the habit of, of sending NSLs? I don't know, because they come with <laughs> gag orders in them, as you yeah, say. So but you can't I mean, know. I think that um, I haven't heard of other libraries getting any, but, um, but I think that probably if they are, they would follow the Connecticut Forest example. And the Tor browser is working well? I, I think so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Stop by the Tor booth and say hi. Hi, thanks for hi. your work. Um, I was wondering what you think the public's role could be in pushing back against the compulsory use of DRM in library settings and also the exploitative pricing of wonderful but horribly like priced uh, digital subscriptions. I'm going to give this one to you. I would say talk to your library that you don't want DRM uh, on your ebooks, right? That that actually doesn't work in the more 
make them aware of you know that issue. Um, so part of the issue too is not is publishers too. So uh, publishers idea of copyright and digital rights management is actually regressive. Uh, for I think that the music business, um, even though it was rough, kind of has gotten over the idea of DRM to a certain degree, even though I think maybe the way Spotify works is maybe a step backwards. Uh, so. I guess as a, as a sort of corollary to my original question, do publishers care about library patrons or do they not care what we think? <laughs> So I'm, I'm not a book publisher, but I think that they are thinking about um, their profits, right? <laughs> so. Thanks. Yeah. So I am also a librarian. We're everywhere, apparently. Um, uh, on that note, actually, about what publishers care about, I wonder if you have thought about taking LFI and um, making focused versions of it, like specifically focused on collections and vendor models uh, for people who do collections and whatnot. So um, for everyone in the room, generally, like people have different kinds of jobs in libraries, right? People do various and sundry things. And I can imagine a public services focused thing, a workshop, you know, public libraries, academic libraries, we all have different spins on both the people we work with, but also there's a lot to do with just publishers, right? So is that on the table? Yes. Okay. I'm so glad you asked that. Yeah. Um, so the, the way that Library Freedom Institute is now, it's this six-month training program. It's mostly focused on people who do some kind of public programming or public-facing thing. The next, after this cohort, the next two are going to be four months long just to kind of experiment with a, with a shorter timeline. Mm -hmm. But what I would like to do um, in the future pending uh, getting funding for it. So if you know anyone with money, um, please tell them to give it to me. Um, I would love to do month-long LFIs focused on a specific topic for specific um, you know, competencies or areas of librarianship. Um, the other things that I would like to do in the future with LFI are like have um, meetups, maybe once yearly for LFI graduates or maybe more frequently regionally or focused around specific topics so that we can do like a four day long um, intensive workshop around solving a problem or like thinking deeply about a problem. Um, so, you know, I, I get that, how many librarians are there here? Can you just like raise your hand? Oh, that's so cool. Hello. Oh, hi, welcome. Um, if you have ideas for, for things like that that you would like to see from LFI in the future, we would definitely like to hear them. Um, and then just in case anyone is curious, like the future future, I want to turn Library Freedom into a cooperative. So um, if you know about doing that, um, it seems hard. And so tell me how to do it. Uh, so yeah, thank you for your question. I hope I answered it. Yeah, I do know Mickey Metz and I was planning on talking to her about it. So thank you for reminding me that. Yes. Hi. So uh, whenever I connect to my uh, public library account, it is always over. Uh, can you can you go a little closer to the mic? I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So whenever I connect to my uh, public library account, it is always over HTTP. It is never HTTPS. And uh, my borrowing history, I was never able to find. I don't know whether it's good or bad. So as part of your initiative, are you making sure these things are secure? And uh, you talked about money. Uh, are you taking donations for this initiative? Am I taking donations for, I'm sorry, for, for teaching HTTPS? Is that what you said? So if, if you want to donate to this initiative, uh, uh, how do we do that? Oh, yeah, you, there is a, you can donate to Library Freedom Project. We are, um, we, your donations are tax deductible. We are fiscally sponsored by the TOR project. Um, thank you, TOR. And so, um, yeah, there's a donation link on our, on our page if you want to donate. And uh, my, my previous question, as part of your initiative, are you making sure this kind uh, the data or uh, this kind of account settings or this? Uh, I'm settings? sorry, I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. So my first question was, uh -huh. whenever I connect to my public library account, it is always via HTTP. It is not via HTTPS. Yes. Uh -huh. And um, I never able to find my borrowing history. I don't know whether it is good or bad. How, are you, as part of your initiative, are you making sure these things are secured? Yeah, so um, H teaching librarians about the importance of HTTPS is, is a big part of, of what we teach. Um, actually, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has made a number of resources specifically for helping librarians understand the importance of HTTPS. 
and using things like Let's Encrypt and making it a little bit easier for them to encrypt their whole websites. And so that's something, like one of the earliest victories I think we had with Library Freedom Project was um, we did something called the um, Library Digital Privacy Pledge where we had libraries, vendors, um, different like like library consortiums like people you know organizations that prov provide services to libraries we had them agree to sign this pledge which was basically them committing to use https on all the services they control within six months of signing and we got like i don't know how many um several dozen and some really big vendors like jstor signed it um big library institutions like the Digital Public Library of America, and they actually then went on to use Let's Encrypt on their entire website, and they documented how they did it. Um, and so for your library, um, you could, if you look on our website, you can find the Digital Privacy Pledge. We're no longer soliciting participation in it. It was like okay. a, a one-year project that we did, but they can at least see the other libraries that signed on. We talk about why it's important, and then we have some links to resources for how they can do it themselves. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you. Um, oh, we, okay, I'm seeing a sign that says stop, so uh, that means stop. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. And if you have more questions for us, we will be at the tour booth. See you there.